so many options. Let's go ahead and pray really quick. Lord, as we come before you again tonight, we thank you for all that you're doing for us. We thank you for this time uh, that we can come, hear from your word. Pray that you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit right now, God. And I pray that uh, we would get exactly what you have for us tonight from the message. We ask all this your most holy and precious name. Amen. You may be seated. I forgot that last Sunday night. I don't want Brother Ken to have to stand all, you know, service long in here, so. <laughs> Just so you know, I pick on Brother Ken because he picks on me because that means we love each other. So. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> really quick, we're going to go ahead and give some announcements, and then we'll get into the offering tonight. But welcome once again to Lighthouse Baptist Church. So good to be here tonight. Um, <clears throat> really quick, the small groups. As I said this morning, we're moving all small groups uh, from Sunday to the midweek service, so the Wednesday night service. Uh, I know some small groups, they may do it on another night, and I, I believe that's fine. I don't think there's any problem with that. Um, as far as the youth group goes, still be doing it on Saturdays because on Wednesday night we have our youth group time. So we will keep that on Saturdays. And uh, I will be letting everyone know if we'll continue in person or online for that. But uh, that is how we're going to be moving forward with small groups. Family Fishing Fellowship, June 6th, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Make sure you bring a lunch. It'll be a fun time. Um, that's going to be out at the ponds north of Dolores. So make sure you uh, make time to do that. I know uh, someone's got a birthday next Saturday. He's not listening to me, is he? And uh, so they're doing their own little fishing trip already. But uh, he was like, man, Pastor had to go schedule it on my birthday. But, well, Dalton, I don't think he's hearing me back there. No. <laughs> but uh, we are going to have a family fishing, fishing fellowship uh, on June the 6th. And then men's barbecue and skeet shoot June 19th. And I uh, know that's going to be a fun time, and uh, we will have more details coming out on uh, just signing up for it, registering for it, and then also uh, the location and so on and so forth. Uh, the resource bank, just really quick, like I said this morning, uh, we could use some more things like peanut butter, jelly, so on and so forth. We got bread plenty right now. Um, you don't need to bring any bread in. If you need some bread, you let me know, and we'll get you some. Um, but <clears throat> we can use more stuff like that, some more meat and cheeses. Uh, that is actually one area we don't have any left in. So if you want to bring some packages of pre-sliced cheese, uh, just some meat packages, you can get uh, whatever, you, whatever you find the best deal there. Um, but we could use some of that for the next outreach. And that is going to be in two weeks, not this next Saturday, but the Saturday after that. So uh, anytime between now and then, if you can get those supplies in, we'd appreciate that. And then uh, you always could use more toilet paper to help hand out to people. I know that's a blessing when we went out. One week I was given toilet paper, they're like, really? You're giving toilet paper? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, oh, I'll take it. <laughs> Let me tell you. But um, so anything you can bring in for that, we'd appreciate it. And then uh, that is it for announcements tonight. And gentlemen in the back, if we go ahead and come forward for an offering, we'll take a moment to worship our Lord through our giving. And really quick, uh, I believe you said I could do this. Um, I just want to let you guys know after the announcement this morning. Um, the, uh, some of the, the details, if you would, and I, I won't be long, but uh, back in October, God really started working on my heart. And uh, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, we told the teenagers last night, uh, shed a lot of tears together, tears of joy and tears of sorrow. And uh, it's, been, it's been rough on us. It's been rough. I'm not up here complaining, um, but I, I told the teenagers that I did something wrong. Um, it's because I fought God. I've been preaching to them and telling them, follow God, do what God tells you to do in your life. Mm -hmm. Do exactly what he tells you to do. Follow him. He knows the best plan for you. Mm -hmm. And um, I wasn't doing it myself. And uh, I fought God. And I said, no, God, I don't want to leave. I don't want to go. I don't want to get away from here. We're comfortable here. We like it here. Our family's here. And I said, I don't want to leave, God. And um, in the end, I, I knew I had to submit to what he wanted and to what he was telling me to do. And I did, and uh, it was actually uh, January when we went to CTX, the end of January, and that was the hardest time because I know in my mind, I'm thinking I'm taking these young people to CTX to go get them to God, if you would, and get them closer to God and try to help them with having a relationship with God. And while we're doing that, um, I'm thinking i got to leave now. And I, I saw our young people get their hearts right. And just do such an amazing job and follow God. And I thought, man, if they're going to follow God here, I've got to do the same. And I said, Lord, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. 
And uh, so on that note, <clears throat> it's not really private, but uh, I'm not going to tell you the church's name for right now just because we haven't been voted in. Um, that's going to take place on the 14th, and we preach for this next Sunday. Um, but it is in Arkansas. Um, so nonetheless, I've been telling some people I need to lose some weight. I'm going to lose some weight in the heat there if I go. <laughs> um, but uh, we're excited, um, but also we're aching at the same time because we, we love this church. And it's always going to be our church family. Uh, just because we're leaving doesn't mean we're not a part of you still in some way. Uh, we love you guys, and we appreciate everything you've done for us the last three years. And uh, it's been a blessing to be here at Lighthouse Baptist Church. So, uh, Brother Don Wilson, would you lift up your voice as the Lord bless the Father? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the rain. We have a little bit to go. And uh, just appreciate it. We could use some more. That's a good plan for us. Father, we thank you for the uh, Atkins family. We'll watch over them as they prepare to go to Arkansas next week to keep them safe. Lord, give them and the church their wisdom. And that's where you want them. And I do that. Father, we pray that you be each one of our missionaries around the world. Watch over them. Uh, just take care of them, Lord, and bless them. We thank you for being able to be faithful in our giving. Father, we ask that you be a pastor as he brings the message tonight. If there's one here that doesn't know you're a Savior, speak to the heart. Holy Spirit, and draw them unto him tonight. Bless the offering now, and we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 the message tonight, I want to do something special. I, I mentioned this to you, so I hope this is still okay. Um, I want to sing a song tonight, and I want the kids to help me sing this song tonight. If any of you kids that are here, you'd like to come up here and help me. We're going to sing Jesus Loves the Little Children. <laughs> Some of the teenagers are pushing each other. You need to go up there. Come on up here. You can help me tonight. We're all going to sing it. And you know what? Uh, We've been reminded of the importance of knowing Jesus through all these things that have been going on. And I want you guys to stand over here. How about it, okay? Right over here on this side so everybody can see you. You guys know Jesus loves the little children. I need you all to help us sing it as well. And we're going to join together in singing this song together. But I'm glad red, yellow, black, white, they're all precious in his sight. And uh, Jesus is <laughs> certainly not a racist. He loves all men. And that's the kind of love we should have towards each other as well. So let's sing this song together. You, you, you little boys and girls, help me. And then everybody else will sing with us. Jesus loves little children. Here we go. Jesus loves the sit down and join us and we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 9. I've been really looking forward to getting back to this chapter. 
in the book of Hebrews. And so we'll be in Hebrews uh, chapter number 9 tonight. As we turn here in the scriptures uh, to Hebrews chapter number 9, we're continuing our verse-by-verse series through the book of Hebrews, and uh, looking forward to what God has in store for us here uh, this evening together as we continue in this chapter. There are outlines in the back, on the table in the back. Um, If you haven't got a chance to grab one of those, you can slip back there and grab it here real quickly. Um, if you would like to do so. Lots of scripture we'll be looking at tonight. We'll be able to turn to all the scriptures. So that's why I give you that outline uh, so that you'll be able to have those verses ready to go. Um, the book of Hebrews, it's a one of it's been vastly become uh, one of my favorite books of the Bible. It's a book that emphasizes again and again and again and again that Jesus is better. He's better than the prophets. He's better um, than than man. He's better than the angels. He's better than the old covenant. Uh, He's given us something that is so much better in this day that we're living in today. And as we have marched through the book of Hebrews, we found that Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 7, after conveying to us how much better Jesus is, the Bible continues to uh, uh, emphasize that theme to us. In Hebrews 7, The Bible shows us how Jesus uh, ministers on our behalf uh, through a better priesthood. He's our great high priest. And he has come and offered up himself as a sacrifice for our sins. And as our high priest applied his blood for the mercy seat of God in heaven so that we could experience an eternal salvation. And it is a beautiful picture we see. And because of Jesus' high priestly ministry, in Hebrews chapter 8, we learn that he administers this, uh, administers on our behalf according to a new covenant. A new covenant which he has established in his own blood, which we're reminded of every time we take of the Lord's table together. That new covenant uh, established through Jesus' shed blood on the cross. And we've marched our way now to Hebrews chapter 9, where we're finding that Jesus, as our high priest, ministers on our behalf in a new sanctuary. And it's a better sanctuary. It's so much better than what they had in the Old Testament. Now, some of you, when you walked in, if if you missed it, you also see it on your way out. On the back table, I put the model of the replica that uh, Jerry Kern made of the Old Testament tabernacle. On that, back, on that back table. It's actually very fascinating to go through and see every one of the artifacts on there. He did a really good job with it. And that was the Old Testament tabernacle. It was so limited. It was made of the things of this earth. And sinful high priest ministered in that old tabernacle. We talked about all the limitations that are described in that old tabernacle. The first part of Hebrews chapter 9. And now as we continue to go through... Uh, what the Bible has to teach us here in Hebrews chapter 9. The first thing we noticed was the inferiority of the old sanctuary. And now we're getting to the second point that I want to draw out and continue on with here tonight. And that is the superiority of the new sanctuary. The new sanctuary is so much better because of all the reasons that are listed for us here in Hebrews chapter 9. And this is a fascinating chapter of scripture. It is so foundationally important for our understanding of the gospel and of our Christian life. And of the truth um, that that really holds us together as the people of God. Uh, These chapters have become so much more important to me in studying them verse by verse. And I hope you see why as we continue to march through these things here tonight. And so here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to read a, a, a rather lengthy portion of scripture together to begin to refresh our minds on where we're at here. And so we're going to begin in Hebrews chapter number 9 and beginning with verse number 11. If you're with me tonight, say amen. Amen. The Bible says in verse 11, But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of the heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. And we're going to come back to what the Bible talks about in these next several verses next week. But for now, I want you to go down with me to verse 24. 
For the Bible says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, that he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now the Bible has so much to teach us here um, about this subject of Jesus' ministry on our behalf, about his finished work. And so let's bow our heads together and let's ask God to speak to our hearts through his word that we're going to dig into here tonight. Father, we come before you tonight. We need you to work in our hearts. You're, you are the teacher. And uh, Lord, I've enjoyed you teaching me these truths and confirming them more in my heart. And I pray that you would allow them to come across in a clear way, in a concise way. And in a convicting way. And help us, Lord, wherever our mind uh, mindset has been wrong, wherever our theology might be a little bit off, to, to come to truly understand what the Bible teaches. And uh, the truly liberating fact that uh, there, there is a finished work that you have accomplished on our behalf uh, through Jesus' shed blood. And we're thankful for that. And I pray that that would become more and more real to us as we consider Jesus' ministry on our behalf tonight. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. We're talking about the superiority of the uh, new sanctuary that Jesus has set up for us through the work that he came and finished on our behalf. We've already looked at the first two reasons why the new sanctuary is so much superior than the old tabernacle of the Old Testament. And the first two reasons that we looked at, it's superior because it is a heavenly tabernacle. Well, you can write that down in your notes if you don't have it already. It's superior because it's a heavenly tabernacle. Um, it's not a made of things of this earth. It's an eternal thing. It's something that cannot fade away. It's reserved in heaven for eternity for you and I. Praise God for that. Number two, we saw in a previous week that it's superior because it operates on spiritual ordinances, <laughs> not carnal ordinances. It doesn't just deal with the outward. In fact, it deals with something so much more significant. It deals with the inward. And we're going to talk about that more next week. But it's superior because it operates on spiritual ordinances. But number three tonight, and this is where we're going to pause uh, to really think about what the scripture has to teach us. Number three, you can write this down. The new tabernacle that Jesus has established for us is superior because it is conducted by a superior high priest. It is conducted by... By a superior high priest. Now already, as we studied earlier in Hebrews chapter 7, we discovered how much better Jesus' high priestly ministry is on our behalf. And for that reason, I'm not going to take a lot of time here tonight, or I'm not anticipating it, unless the Lord leads me to do so, uh, to part on this point right here. And yet there are some new and wonderful truths that are brought out here in Hebrews chapter 9 that we did not discover in Hebrews chapter 7. Uh, I think it's necessary for us just to think about what the Bible is teaching us here about Jesus' superior high priestly ministry on our behalf. I'm going to give you two reasons for why I believe the Bible indicates here in Hebrews 9, Jesus' high priestly ministry is so much superior than those old high priestly, oh, this, those old, the ministry of those old high priests in the Old Testament. Number one, you can write this down, his high priestly ministry is superior because he, Jesus, is sinless. He's sinless. He's never done anything wrong. Old, in, in, in the Old Tabernacle, in the Old Testament, sinful men were appointed as high priests. Not because they were qualified, but because of the family they were born into. It was just that God chose a certain family to be the people who were the high priests. And we find all through the, the record of the Old Testament that there were many of those so-called high priests who were corrupt men. Many of those priests who even were uh, killed by God in the Old Testament for their corruption. And uh, we find there's many examples of that in the Old Testament. But we do find that according to that old system, sinful men were appointed as high priests. And as such, think about this, they could never help someone else deal with the problems of their own sins before they, had, before they dealt with their own first. In other words, they had to offer up a sacrifice for themselves first before they could get to helping you. That's a problem. Um, that's a limitation that we see demonstrated in these high priests in the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 7 
and verse number 28, it says, For the law makes men high priests which have infirmity. It means they have issues. They have, they have uh, limitations. They have sin problems. Hebrews 7 and verse number 27 tells us that these sinful high priests had to offer up sacrifices first for their own sins and then for the sins of the people. And so we see this limitation, this difficulty in the high priest of, uh, 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 from mankind in the old covenant system. And yet in stark contrast to that, we find Jesus. And we find that Jesus is a high priest on our behalf who is without fault. He's never done anything wrong. In fact, he's never even thought about doing something wrong. The Bible tells us time and time and time and time and time again about the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22 that says that Jesus did no sin, neither was any guile found in his mouth. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 26, the Bible says, For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins, and then for the peoples, for this he did once when he offered up himself. Let me, let me clarify this very, very simply for you. Jesus doesn't come with any baggage. Come on. You ever got into a friendship or into a relationship and realized, boy, they came, in, they came with some baggage. <laughs> They've got some issues. I'm glad when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. We're the only ones bringing issues to the relationship. He doesn't come with any, with any issues. He's sinless. He's holy. When I come to him with my issues, I don't have to worry about tomorrow him coming to me with his issues. He doesn't have any. I mean, he is able to focus on, 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 on me because of the fact that he's sinless and yet he can identify with me because he walked this earth. And he knows the difficulties that you and I go through. That's who Jesus Christ is. That's why he's such a superior high priest on our behalf. That's why he's so much better. And just think about this. The Bible just told us Jesus. He didn't need to offer up a sacrifice for himself to be able to atone for our sins. No, he didn't have to because he didn't have any sin. And so the answer was that Jesus offered up himself as the sacrifice. He was the perfect sac sacrifice. A lamb without blemish. And without spot is how First Peter describes him. And he's such a superior high priest because he is a sinless one. But number two tonight, I want you to notice also, he is superior in his high priestly ministry because he sacrificed himself. I want you to notice something that's repeated several times in Hebrews chapter 9 here. In verse number 11, look there with me. The Bible says, but Christ being come in high priest, it was talking about his priestly ministry. Verse 12 goes on to say, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Verse 14 goes on to say that he, through the eternal spirit, offered up himself without spot to God. Later on, in the end of, towards the end of uh, Hebrews chapter 9, it talks about how the old high priest... They had to bring up an offering blood sacrifice of, of an innocent animal to be able to atone their sin for their own sins before they could help someone else. And it emphasizes how those old high priests had to sacrifice someone else, something else, to be able to fulfill the ministry of the high priest, their high priestly ministry. But what we find in Jesus Christ is someone who didn't kill someone else to pay for his own sins, but someone who offered up himself as the sacrifice. To pay for all of our sins. And that is what makes him superior. No one else ever could do that. And no one else ever did it because of that. By the, well, by the way, I don't think anybody else ever would have been willing to do that either. Only Jesus could do that for us. And that's what makes him so much better. And so we find instead of sacrificing an innocent victim, we find Jesus sacrificed himself. To forever atone for our sins. Can I say to you this evening, there is no greater love that a person could ever show than sacrificing himself for his enemies. And that is precisely what Jesus did for us. Jesus said in John 15, greater love hath no man than this, but a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus laid down his life for us when we were his enemies. When we were estranged from him 
For when we were yet without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. Romans chapter 6 tells us. When we were his enemies, he reconciled us to himself by the sacrifice of himself. Romans 6 goes on to tell us that's what Jesus has accomplished for us. And that shows us how great he truly is as a high priest on our behalf. You see, this is precisely the reason why Jesus came into this world. To give his life a ransom for many. Amen. The Bible says in uh, Mark chapter 10 verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Yeah. Hey, there was no sacrifice that you or I could ever make that would deal with what we deserve for our sins. That's right. I don't care how many, how many times you come to church. How many times you jump in a, into baptismal waters. I don't care how much money you put in the plate over the course of your life. I don't care how many things you try to do to outweigh your bad with good things. You're never going to be able to outweigh all the bad that you've done with good things that you try to do. That's right. The Bible says if you can keep the whole law and then mess up in one point of it, you're guilty of it all. That's a high standard. I can't keep that. You can't keep that. There's no sacrifice you and I or any priest or any other man ever could have offered up that could forever atone for our sins. But Jesus gave the one sacrifice that, the, and the only sacrifice that could ever be sufficient, and that was himself. Right. He offered up himself Amen. as a sacrifice for our sins. That's why the Bible goes on in verse number 26 at the latter part of the verse. And it says, but now, once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And so praise God that the one who has conducted the sacrifice for our sin in the new sanctuary, he is one that is worthy to do so. And he is one who is willing to do so. To sacrifice up his own, to sacrifice his own, his own self. Up as a, as, as a sufficient payment for our sins. Amen. That's why his high priestly ministry is so superior. Hey, that's why when we come to God through the new sanctuary, we know we have a high priest who can always give us access, who has already made a way for us to come in because we know what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. And so the new sanctuary is superior uh, because it's being conducted by a superior high priest, unlike those old faulty ones in the, in the uh, Old Testament. Now I want to move on to the next thing here. The new section, sanctuary that Jesus has established for us is superior. I want you to note down number four. And this will be the final one we focus on for tonight. This reason. It's superior, number four, because it is a finished work. It is a finished work. You know, we often refer to the finished work of Jesus Christ. But I think sometimes we can get lost in theological terms. And not really understand what that means for us. Finished work. Let's read about it here in Hebrews chapter 9. Just think about what the scripture has to say here. About Jesus' work on our behalf. In verse number 12. Again I read. Neither by the blood of goats and calves. But by his own blood he entered in once. I have that word circled several times in this passage of scripture. He entered in once into the holy place. Having obtained, read the next two words with me, eternal redemption wow. for us. Go on to verse 26. For the Bible read, or verse 24, let's go into 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, but into heaven itself. Not to appear, uh, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often. As the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. He's talking about the day of atonement there. For then must he have suffered since the foundation of the world. By the way, he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And that was a one-time sacrifice. He's not continuing to be slain. But now, the Bible says here in verse 26. How many, how many times? Once. There it is again. Oh, I circle that if I were you. Once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment, so Christ was, next two words, read them with me, once offered 
to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now think about this with me, church. We saw earlier in this chapter how the old tabernacle was so inferior because it required a continual work to be done to atone for the sins of the people. And these high priests, they had to continue to bring these sacrifices year after year after year. That's what was emphasized. And there was, they were never done. The priests uh, never sat down in the tabernacle because their job was never done. So long as they were standing in the tabernacle, they were standing. In fact, it was a, it was a big no-no to sit down while you were in the tabernacle if you were serving as a high priest. And so we see how limited the old system truly was in looking at that. And yet when we look to the new tabernacle and the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ, what we find is that it is a finished work. And it's also turning out the lights. <laughs> I'm going to keep going. Um, it actually is wonderful. It's not hot. Oh, man, he turned the lights back on. <laughs> but it's a finished work. And repeated time and time again, as we just noticed throughout really chapters 9 and chapters 10, as we're going to get into that uh, very soon, the word once is repeated over and over again. You know, there's just some words like that that are so beautiful for us to read as the children of God. Amen. I like the word once when I read it in the scripture. I like the word all when I read it in the scripture in the context of salvation. It's a gift that's offered to all. I like the word whosoever. I like the word love. And God loved the world. But the word once, it's a beautiful word. It's a, it's, a Hebrew, it's a Greek word, I should say, that literally means once for all. I mean once for all. And uh, that's what we sang the song tonight. Once for all, oh brother, believe it. Christ has redeemed us once for all. That's what that truth comes from. And we read, we read this word over and over again throughout this passage. And this word tells us all we need to know about the security of our salvation. That's all we need to know. And boy, to these Hebrew believers, this was so important. Why? Well, because they were Jews. And they had grown up and they had been trained in their mindset to think we have to continue to bring sacrifices every year. And now it was natural for them to want to, change, to convert that directly into Christianity, into faith in Jesus Christ. Oh, I need to keep on making this decision every year. I need to keep on coming back to this every, every time I have struggles. It was natural for them to think that that was how it was supposed to be. And that's why the author of Hebrews is so insistent to say, don't you understand what Jesus has done for us is nothing like what you had before. It's so much better than what you had before. It's a once-for-all sacrifice. It's a once-for-all salvation. That's what Jesus has provided for us. And that's what he labors to get across to us here. And so the fact is, Jesus, he isn't going continually into the presence of God to offer up a fresh sacrifice for your sins. No! He did it one time, and one time was forever enough. And church, it's about time we just start believing it. It's about time we just start trusting in the Lord. Now, there's two elements of this that I want us to think about before we're done here this evening. Number one, as we think about the fact that the Lord, the, the, the new tabernacle Jesus has set up for us is so much superior because it is a finished work. Number one, write this down. His sacrifice is eternally sufficient. His sacrifice is eternally sufficient. We've read a couple of times already about how Jesus entered into the presence of God, not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own blood. Verse 12 talks about that. What we find here expressed in chapters 9 and 10 is that the blood of the bulls and goats slain in the Old Testament, they only had the ability to cover the sins of the people. What they couldn't do was take them away. To fully take them away. They could never do that. All they could do was cover the sins of the people. And those sins could be uncovered again. And need to be covered again. But they could not take away those sins. From the account of the life of the individual. In fact, if you look at Hebrews chapter 10. Look at chapter 10 and verse number 4. The Bible says, for it is what? Oh, uh oh. It's impossible. 
that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. It was impossible for them to be fully saved for eternity by going that route. See, only Jesus is the one who has the ability to put away our sins. Only the sacrifice of Jesus is what we can call eternally sufficient to pay for our sins. Now notice again what verse 12 says. It says, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place. And then read the last phrase with me together. Having obtained eternal redemption for us. Having obtained, that's an interesting phrase here in the scripture. I mean, what the Bible is indicating from that, from that phrase right there is that he already had it paid for before he ever stepped into the presence of God. Why? Well, he already died on the cross. Having obtained, I mean, he already had it in possession. I mean, he had it in his hand. Having obtained what? Eternal redemption for us. Now, that's significant. Eternal redemption. That's talking about a deliverance that's without beginning and without ending. I mean, when God looks at us, it's not like he said, well, you were bad up to this point and then you were good. No, because when he looks at us now, he sees the blood of Jesus Christ. He sees us eternally redeemed, eternally delivered. Forever past, forever present, forever future, we are redeemed when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's a wonderful truth for us to understand right there. And the Bible says it was all possible because Jesus had in his hand when he entered into the presence of God one time his blood that was sufficient to pay for our sins. And so then here's the question. Why is his blood sufficient to pay for our sins? Well, I like how 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18 puts it. 1 Peter 1, 18, it's in your notes, look at it with me. The Bible says, for as much as you know, you are not redeemed with what, George? Corruptible. Corruptible things. Things of this earth. Hey, we could put it this way. Things from an earthly tabernacle. Things from an earthly building like this. I'm not saved because you step in this building, because you get dipped in water. You're not redeemed with corruptible things. But it goes on to say in verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Don't miss this. We already talked about this. When we talked about Jesus as our high priest. Hey, the Bible says Jesus was a lamb without blemish and without spot. Fact is, Jesus was innocent. So he didn't have to shed his blood for his own sins. And then we find that the Bible teaches us he became a man so he could die for the sins of mankind as a substitute. We don't have time to go there tonight, but if you went back and read Romans chapter 5, you would find that sin came into the world by one man. And so it was necessary that by one man that sin was paid for. The problem was none of us as sinful men could be a, be a sufficient sacrifice to pay for the sins of the world. And so what did God do? God became a man. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, Jesus came to die as a man, being sinless, to pay for the sins of men. That's why it was necessary for him to come the way that he did. And because he came as the sinless son of God and shed his blood, his blood was forever sufficient to pay for your sins and for my sins. And so now when you put your faith in Jesus, his sacrifice is sufficient to eternally deliver you from the condemnation of your sin and to make you righteous in the eyes of God. That is only possible. Through the finished work of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The Bible says uh, later on in that same passage that God has made Jesus to be sin for us. Even though he knew no sin. Why? So that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God made a great exchange through Calvary. Jesus came and he exchanged with us the rags of our wretchedness and gave us in their place the robes of his righteousness. And now, through faith in Jesus Christ, when God looks at you, he sees you by a term that the Bible calls justified. That means declared righteous. He sees you as righteous. 
Not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus has done for you. Why? Because his sacrifice is eternally sufficient to pay for your sins once for all. And all we need to understand this right here. By the way, this is why when Jesus hung on the cross, he shouted out a phrase. Some of you could probably tell me what it was. To tell us that. You know what it means? It is finished. <laughs> it's done. Everything I came to do, it's done. I paid for the sin. I paid for your sins. It is finished. And boy, if we just start believing what Jesus himself said from the cross. Why are you trying to think? Why are you trying to make it out to where Jesus needs to get back on the cross when he himself hung on the cross? He said it's finished. Just believe what Jesus said. Just believe what Jesus has done for you today. That's the place where we need to come to as the people of God. And so we find Jesus isn't still on the cross like some religions try to portray him to be. No, he's not still on that cross. Nor does he need to keep going back to that cross to pay for sins that you commit after you put your faith in him. No, what the Bible teaches us is that he went to the cross and paid for all the sins of the world in a once for all sacrifice. And then as our high priest, he took the bloody shed on Calvary and applied it, having already obtained for us eternal redemption, applied it before the throne of God. And friend, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are saved, saved, saved. Nothing can change you. Because his sacrifice is eternally sufficient. To pay for your sins and to pay for mine. That's why the Bible says in verse 25, Nor yet that he should offer up himself often as the high priest enter into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he have suffered from the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away. I like that phrase, put away. Yeah. That phrase, put away, is a Greek word that means to abolish or to disannul, to make of no power. Hey, he's appeared once in the end of the world to put away sin by the sacrifice of yourself. I believe the Bible puts it in the, in the Old Testament, the book of Psalms, as far as the east is from the west. So far hath he removed our transgressions from us. It's a wonderful illustration of what Jesus has accomplished for us. Did you understand something? The east and the west, they never meet. The East will never come around and come into contact with the West if you follow it around the globe. It's just not going to happen. And it's a beautiful picture of what's been accomplished for us because of our salvation. What it tells us is that our sins are never going to come back to be held up against us. They've been removed. They've been removed. That's why we sing the song so often. What sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. From the book of life, they've all been torn out. And I don't remember them anymore. Yep. You, don't, you don't remember them anymore. That's a great truth right there. That's why his new, this new sanctuary that Jesus ministers to us through, this heavenly sanctuary, is so much better. Because it is a finished work. And we understand that because his sacrifice is eternally sufficient. And finally tonight, we understand that because his service is eternally speaking. Write that down, number two in your notes. His service is eternally speaking. I know I'm running out of time here tonight, but I want you to see this. Oh, this is good. Don't, don't lose me now. Sometimes with the text, my favorite part comes at the end and everybody's starting to fall asleep on me. You know? So just, just wake up for me a little bit, okay? And I, nobody's actually falling asleep. I'm just kidding around with you. But Hebrews chapter 10, and look at verse number 12. Hebrews 10 and verse 12. The Bible says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And read the last phrase with me, and, or read the last verse with me, verse 13 here. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Hey, after Jesus finished his high priestly work, he sacrificed himself as an offering for our sins. And then he brought the blood of his sacrifice as an atonement to pay for our sins before the mercy seat of God in heaven. After he finished that work through his death and three days later his resurrection and ascension, we find that after all of this took place, uh, the Bible says that Jesus... Sat down. 
expecting something to happen. He sat down expecting something to happen. Well, what was he expecting to happen? Well, this is beautiful. That word expecting, it's the Greek word ekdekomai. It means to look for something, to anticipate something, to wait for something. The Bible says he, after he finished the work, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, expecting until his enemies be made his footstool. What is Jesus expecting today? Jesus is expecting the fulfillment of all that is entailed in our salvation. And all you don't know, you're not going to want to miss this truth because this truth is so helpful for the things that we're going through here today. You see, the fact of the matter is, when Jesus saved us, that work that he began in us is a work that is continuing and will be fully realized when Jesus comes again to bring us unto himself. Adrian Rogers, one of my favorite preachers, he used to put it this way. He said, salvation is I am saved, I am being saved, and I shall be saved. And what the Bible teaches us is that salvation, immediately we are set free from the penalty of sin. And praise God for that. And right now as we walk through this world, we are also free, or being freed, from the power of sin. Sin has no more power over us. Now, sometimes we can submit ourselves and allow ourselves to come under the power of sin, but that's because of a choice. Jesus has set us free from the power of sin. One day, Jesus is coming again, and he's going to bring us to himself. You know what's going to happen on that day? We're going to be delivered from the very presence of sin. No more struggles with it. I'm looking forward to that day. This is often what is called the three tenses of our salvation. And it is a wonderful thing for us to think about here. And it's also illustrated here in Hebrews chapter 9. Look at verse number uh, 26. The latter part of verse 26. Here's the first tense of our salvation. It says, now once in the end of the world, he hath, what's the next word? Appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's what happened when we got saved. He put away our sin. We're free from sin. Free from sin's condemnation. The second phase, the second tense of our salvation is seen in verse number 24, where the Bible says, um, towards the end of the verse, it says that Christ has now entered into heaven itself, now to what? Appear. Well, he keeps on appearing all over the place. And when he shows up, <laughs> wonderful things happen. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. What is Jesus doing now? He's appearing in the presence of God for us. Hey, he's pleading. He's ever interceding on our behalf in the heavenlies. We learned that in Hebrews chapter 7. That's happening right now. I'm glad, as 1 John says, whenever the enemy comes to come and bring up accusations against me, Jesus stands as my advocate in heaven and says, no, those sins are paid for. I'm glad Jesus stands there today ever interceding on my behalf. But the final tense of our salvation is seen in verse number 28. Where the Bible says at the end of the verse, And unto them that look for him shall he, what? Appear. There it is again. Appear. The second time without sin unto what? Salvation. salvation. He'll appear without sin unto salvation. So get this. Jesus first came... When he, when he first came, he died as a sacrifice to atone for our sins. And now the Bible tells us that he sits in heaven advocating and interceding for us, anticipating the day when he's going to return. He's given us his spirit to give us power over sin as we walk through this world. And we are not getting more and more saved in that sense. But what is happening is that we're growing and understanding and implementing what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. That's what the Bible says all throughout the Bible to grow in God's grace. Um, that's what's happening to us right now as believers in Jesus Christ. But one day, and what a day that'll be, the Bible says Jesus is coming again. And on that day, we're going to be delivered forever from the very presence of sin. We're going to be made once again, put into a heavenly body, a glorified body, like Jesus Christ himself. 
And that is the day that we get to look forward to as the people of God. That's what the Bible says in places like Philippians 1 and verse 6. Being confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will, will perform it into the day of Jesus Christ. What we find in understanding the finished work of Jesus Christ is that because he's the one that's completed it, he's also the one that's going to continue to carry it out. Religion will try to tell you after you get saved, you've got to live up to it. But what the Bible teaches us is the salvation Jesus has given to me is a finished work. And that that work, the Lord Jesus is going to complete for every one of us. Hey, for the time being, when we got saved, Jesus put a down payment on, on our life. You know what that down payment was? His Holy Spirit. He said, okay, that one's mine. <laughs> I bought and paid for him. I'm coming back to get him one day. He put his mark on us of ownership. One day he is coming. And he's going to receive us unto himself. That where he is, there we may be also. Hey, your salvation, in other words, is not up for you to keep. Your Savior is the one who keeps you. Amen. Salvation is not something you need to worry about finishing. It's something that's already been finished for you through what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. Amen. That's why it's important we understand these things. Romans chapter 8 says... Verse 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It goes on in verse number 22 and says, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, that down payment of the Spirit I just talked about, even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. With all these things that are going on in our world right now, I said this the other day. It's really made me begin to long for home. Right. I'm talking about the home I lived in down the street. Right. Talking about home. Paul right. The Bible says the whole creation is groaning and travailing in pain together. When is all of this going to be made right? When is all this madness going to be over? When is somebody going to step on the scene and set everything right and make everything straight? The day's coming. We know because we know Jesus. The whole creation is groaning and travailing in pain together. We also are longing for that day when we receive the end of our salvation as 1 Peter 1 talks about. That glorious day. What a day that is going to be for us as the people of God. And so the fact that Jesus sits in heaven today Speaking on your behalf, anticipating the day he gets to return to take you home, believer, it ought to encourage you. And I'm glad there's someone there. And I'm glad there's someone there who's not going to stay there forever, but one day is going to come back for you and I. One day is going to come back and set everything right that is wrong in this world. I'm glad he sits there. And I'm glad I have the hope of seeing him again one day. How important that is. Now, before we're done, I want you to look at the last two verses of this chapter. The Bible says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hey, don't miss this. Every one of us are born into this world. With an appointment we cannot miss. An appointment we will not miss. I had some funny stories about appointments I was going to tell you, but I don't have time to tell you these stories. They're irrelevant right now. You know what that appointment is? Death. The day you're born, God already knows the day you're going to die. I don't care how many masks you wear. <laughs> I don't care how many things you do to try to prevent it. You ain't going to miss that day. God already knows what it's going to be. It's an appointment set by God for every one of us. None of us know what it's going to be. But it is appointed unto men once to die, the Bible says. The fact is, sinful man will find when he comes to that appointment that it is immediately followed 
by eternal judgment in hell for all of eternity. And I say to you this evening that a lost man, because of this, has no hope beyond this life. A lost man has nobody standing in heaven, advocating on his behalf. A lost man will have to stand alone before God one day and try to give an account for all the wrong things he did in vain. And will be condemned to hell for all of eternity. And I need you to go here because we need to focus on this before we're done tonight. Go to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 20. I did not put this in your notes because I want you to see it in your own Bible. Revelation chapter 20, in verse number 11. Now hang with me, we're almost done. If you're there, say amen. Amen. Verse 11, it says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small, and great stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged unto those things which were written in the books according to their works. You know every wrong thing you've done has been written down. And it's going to be read and rehearsed before the whole world one day. And you're going to have to give an account for it if you are lost. Verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which are in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You make no, no mistake about it. It's appointed unto men once to die. And after this, the judgment. And a lost man without Jesus Christ will not miss that appointment. No matter how hard he tries to run while he's living in this world. No matter how many things he tries to do to make himself ignore it. The fact is, the word of God says the day is coming and you better mark it down, it's coming. Every man without Christ will be judged. Jesus said in John chapter 3 and verse 36, He that believes on the Son hath everlasting life. But he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. And I don't believe we preach hard enough on the subject of hell. In the day that we're living in. It's a real place. And real people without Jesus Christ are going to go there. And it's appointed unto men once to die. And after this the judgment. But, and thank God for that clarification. The Bible says in verse 28, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Hey, as believers, we know that Jesus died once for all for our sins and dealt with the final judgment that we deserved. 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 18 says, For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. That's what Jesus has done for us. And because Jesus suffered the penalty we deserve for our sins, we know as the children of God that we will not have to face that judgment one day because Jesus was already judged for us. By the way, that's one of the reasons we put our faith in him. Because he did what we couldn't do for ourselves. He paid for our sins so that we could be saved. And now we know that what we'll face after this lifetime is not judgment. We will, be exalted. We, will, we will be brought to heaven to be with the Lord. We'll have eternal life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Never die. That's the promise that Jesus gave to us. And by the way, that's why the Apostle Paul later in 1 Corinthians 15 said, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't fear dying. Because I know when I die where I'm going. And I know that where I'm going is not to face judgment, but to be with my Lord. And that gives me hope. That's a hope that I want to share 
and every person that I know. And that's a wonderful thing for us to understand as the people of God. Hey, that's why we can look forward to seeing Jesus one day. Because we know, we know that when we see him, we'll be like him. For we'll see him as he is. That's why when we think about the finished work of Jesus Christ, hey, we know we are saved, and we know we're going to continue to be saved until we see Jesus Christ one day. And nothing can disannul that. Jesus paid for our salvation. Nothing we do can undo what he's done for us. It's about time we start believing that as the people of God. And I say to you this evening, I don't know who said this statement. But someone once said, those born once will die twice. But those who are born twice may die once. Every person is born into this world a sinner. And if you don't come to Jesus Christ in faith to deal with your sin, you'll not only die physically one day, but you'll die again spiritually. Eternally separated from God in hell. But if you are born into this world, and you are also born again, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you only have to die once, maybe. Because those of us who are here when Jesus returns will never even face the physical death. And that's been the hope of believers throughout the centuries. And what a wonderful thing that is. But here's the final application I want to bring out. If you're sitting here tonight and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you're a once born person bound for a twice full death. I wouldn't leave this place without trusting Jesus Christ as my Savior. That's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6. Behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. I know this is Sunday night. You say, Pastor, we're all saved in here. No, I don't know that. You know that, and God knows that. And you need to come trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's time to put, quit putting it off. This is literally life and death, heaven and hell. If you're listening online, it's time to get it settled. Today's the day. And for those of us who have believed in Jesus Christ, we get to praise God for his finished work. Because of his finished work, we know both now and for eternity, we can come before the presence of God and enjoy it. And there's nothing, nothing, nothing that can withhold us from that privilege that's been secured for us through the finished work of Jesus Christ. So here's the challenge for us. Let's live like it. Jesus has completed the work of our salvation. Now, let's go forth. Stop living like he hasn't. Stop living in doubt and fear and insecurity. Stop living like I need to keep on getting saved over and over and over again. Start living like you believe Jesus has paid for your sins. And let the joy of that truth transform your life. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes with me today. Our heads are bound. Our eyes are closed. Are you in here tonight and you don't know Jesus is your Savior? Do you know your final destination is not heaven but hell because you're not sure if you've trusted Christ as your Savior? If that's you tonight, you're listening online, if you're sitting in here tonight, I want to encourage you, stop putting it off. I'll have Brother Caleb stand up here at the front. I'm going to tell you, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, whether you're a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, it's time to get it taken care of tonight. Today's the day. If you're a young lady or, or a lady, I'll have Brother Caleb bring you to a lady who can talk with you about how you can trust Jesus as your Savior. But as we have a moment of invitation tonight, if God's speaking to your heart about that, I want to encourage you to come and talk to Him. And He'll get you some help on how you can know Jesus as your Savior tonight. But don't stop putting it off. Tonight's the night. If God's speaking to your heart about that, I can't implore you enough to come. Those of us that know Jesus Christ as our Savior, can we just start resting in the fact 
that Jesus has finished the work of our salvation. I start enjoying what he has bought and paid for us. I want to encourage you. We're not going to be able to have a call forward invitation. But just make an altar out of your seat. And as the Lord has spoken to your heart tonight, hey, would you do business with the Lord tonight? And if you need to come forward for counsel, for prayer, to make the decision to trust Jesus as your Savior, after we pray, I want to encourage you to come. Father, we come before you tonight. I pray you bless these moments of invitation we'll spend together. And if there is someone here who doesn't know you as Savior, Lord, you do the drawing and you do it through your word. And I pray that as your spirit has worked, that if there's someone that needs to come to trust you as Savior tonight, they come. Today's the day. And for us who know you, I pray as you have spoken to our hearts and perhaps revealed areas of our life where we begin to doubt you when it comes to the security of our salvation, when it comes to the reality of your finished work, and help us to have the courage to make the decisions, to talk to you about the things that you have spoken to us about. And perhaps just give you a moment of praise for what you've done on our behalf. We do pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And with our heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask you to stand with me together. If you'd like to stay seated in your seat to pray, feel free to go ahead. But as you stand, if God's spoken to your heart, and you need to get some counsel about trusting Jesus as your Savior tonight. Don't put it off any longer. Wouldn't you step out and come? We'd love to help you with knowing Jesus as your Savior tonight. There's no more important decision you'll make in your life than to trust Jesus as your Savior. If God's spoken to your heart, I want to encourage you to come. once for all. And we would allow that truth to transform our, to renew our minds, as the Bible says in Romans 12. Really change the way we look at life and uh, uh, how we even treat our relationship with you. And we don't have to keep coming back again and again and again because you've already finished the work. What a wonderful truth that is. And Lord, if there's one tuning in tonight or sitting in here that doesn't know you as Savior, still, I pray you give them the courage to reach out to me, to one of the leaders of our church here, so that they may, before they lay their head on their pillow tonight, come to trust you as their Lord and Savior. Well, before it's eternally too late, I pray you'd speak to their hearts on those things. As we go from this place, I pray that you dismiss us with your blessing. And uh, Lord, as we're going through this phase two, and I pray that you just bless us as we have our small groups in the midweek. As we continue to meet on Sundays, I pray that you protect us and give us your favor. Be with our nation, Lord. Turn the hearts of, your, of, of us, the church, as, as your people to you. That we might be able to shine your light brightly, even as we go to our workplaces and to our communities this week. And I pray, God, that we go forth with the truth of your word in our hearts that we've been able to share together today. And dismiss us, Lord, with your blessing. Keep us safe and bring us together at the next appointed time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.